This is a very brief talk. Uh, essentially, as I was saying, we operate in a world where there's no human interaction, there's no release branch. Essentially, once a developer commits a change, at some point in the next 14 days, that change goes live to uh, several hundred machines that are basically entirely autonomous around the world. Um, and what we do with our monitoring system is essentially use it to gate our release process to make sure that only valid builds go live. All right? And we do that in, in three different ways that basically are subsets of our production monitoring um, in our release process. So um, this is about the only interesting slide I have, um, which ironically took us a long time to get up. Um, essentially, uh, we have a fully automated build process that once a commit occurs, it runs through the unit test, does a, a build, um, the unit tested the, the final output of the uh, uh, continuous integration system is automatically deposited into a, an unstable repository. We use uh, uh, a Debian style uh, releasing model where essentially we have several repos and different machines track different versions of different repos. Um, and our test machines, which are segregated from our production machines, um, are on an update cycle that runs about every I think it's every 15 minutes. Um, it's basically very, very fast compared to our production machines, which run twice uh, a day um, on a staggered schedule. So we get our automated builds that come out of our continuous integration system. They go directly into the unstable repo, and within an hour, it uh, is running on an isolated test machine, I'm sorry, a test cluster, which runs a synthetic workload. It's kind of like an integration test, okay? Um, those unstable builds are periodically promoted to our testing repository based upon the signals from our monitoring system, um, as well as the synthetic workload. The testing repo is tracked by our, what we call our canary fleet, which is a subset of our production fleet. Um, the key thing being that it, they run actual production workloads, um, essentially a subset of the traffic that would otherwise go to our production fleet is also going to our canary fleet. And here's what we, where we use our monitoring system to validate that the canary build is behaving in a way that is uh, within the limits that we expect of our production uh, uh, binaries. Specifically, we look for two different things, our KPIs, key performance indicators, uh, uh, QPS uh, performance uh, as far as um, uh, query accuracy and um, uh, memory footprint per input workload, uh, disk utilization, and CPU load. Um, we need to make sure that when we begin to roll out that canary build, I'm sorry, that candidate build to the rest of the fleet, that it's not going to exceed any of our capacity planning limits. Okay? Um, so, Essentially, what we're doing is we are using the same rules we use to verify that we haven't exceeded our capacity plans in our production fleet to make sure that the candidate build is performing the same way that we expect it to perform when it gets rolled out. Does that follow? Okay. So it's a very, very simple process that basically relies upon using the same rules to verify that the fleet is healthy as we use in our canary and we use in our unstable repo. Okay. Um, we use different subsets of our rules for different phases. Um, in the test cluster, all we're looking for is to make sure that we reliably can install the build and we don't basically break the machine itself. Um, and that's because if, of course, you roll out a bad binary that prevents reinstallation of the next binary, um, you're gonna end up with a very bad fleet that has to be manually recovered. Um, we have had that problem once in the past three years uh, where we had a bad binary that got pushed out and that was actually due to an upstart bug um, in our uh, deployment scripts um, where basically we tickled. It turns out that upstart's uh, fork tracking doesn't always reliably detect which of the forks are the actual running binary and so, um, at that point realized we need to make sure that when the binaries restart on the uh, machine, 
that the correct binary is detected as running and continues running. And so we added that to our production monitoring setup. Um, and we added that as an explicit rule in our test cluster uh, to make sure that we can reliably upgrade at every single release just on uh, an isolated machine. Um, in the Canary fleet, um, the, key, the key thing to your Canary fleet, if you don't have a way of creating a subset of your service that is receiving live traffic that can be very quickly and easily excluded from the serving set, then that's something you want to consider figuring out how to do. Um, there's a couple different strategies for doing that. Um, some people will use their load balancer to, to route a subset of their traffic. Um, in extreme cases where you don't have repeatable, where you can't take live traffic and put it to a test version of your service, you use a mechanism where you uh, uh, duplicate your requests to the test service, um, but then discard the results, obviously. Um, at the Canary level, the thing to look for is that your new release won't compromise your fleet as a whole. Um, specifically, uh, if you have a regression with regards to performance, that's the biggest thing we look for. Um, uh, a regression of, let, let's say, the new version of the build uses 20% more memory per request. Well, if your capacity, if you've already spec'd out your capacity such that each of your jobs is limited to, say, four gigabytes, and there's only five gigabytes available on the machine for your allocation, a 20% bump in memory is going to put you right at the limit. And so making sure that you, your new release is not going to eliminate all of your slack uh, uh, um, for outages is really important. Um, we run with a certain amount of overhead available for um, outages and for maintenance. And um, uh, we need to make sure that we aren't going to consume that, erode that gradually over time. And it happens where developers are adding new features and so on. And, and what you thought was a comfortable margin for additional, uh, uh, for outages and for uh, 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 maintenance, uh, it turns out that over the course of six months, nine months, you've now eroded all of that with new features, and now you're no longer running with excess capacity. Um, our production monitoring, this is just normal monitoring stuff, um, but the key thing is um, you want to roll up your production cluster status and make it queryable for your re release gating because you only want to initiate a promotion if your existing cluster is healthy. Um, and this is a bit different than what a lot of people do um, because we want to preclude releases from occurring during, uh, during otherwise known outages without someone having to go and push the big red button. I mean, one of the first things you learn when you do automated, fully automated releasing is you need to put in a button somewhere you can push that stops the fully automated release because when everything's hitting the fan, you don't want to begin kicking off upgrades across your fleet. Um, and so we learned later on that you know it, having the big red button's good, but the person who is dealing with the ongoing outage needs to remember to go and push the big red button. Now, when you have dozens of fully automated release processes working in parallel, that means you now have dozens of buttons that need to be pushed. And that ends up being, uh, well, it ends up creating more work for the guy who's trying to fix the actual root cause of whatever's going wrong at that time. Um, so having your monitoring roll up your alerts into a single signal that you can say, is it safe to push right now, is a very valuable thing. Um, yeah, so alert ag uh, aggregating your alerts. Um, uh, you need to be able to segregate your metrics by the fleet type. This is uh, something that not a lot of monitoring systems make easy. Um, essentially, you need to say, well, am I looking at the RAM usage on, a, uh, on the production fleet or on the canaries or on a test machine. Um, uh, if you haven't set up your metrics to identify what class of machine or what subset of your, your fleet it is that you're looking at, then you're going to have a, hard time, a harder time identifying if you are actually going into a situation where the new release, say, doubles your memory utilization. Um, when a lot of our libraries moved from 32-bit to 64-bit builds, we essentially doubled our RAM footprint for a huge number of things, and that actually caused a lot of, well, 
consternation. Um, there was a lot of churn in our fleet as we discovered that all of a sudden binaries that used to fit comfortably in, say, uh, you know, 200 megs of RAM or, or, or 2 gigs of RAM, all of a sudden needed 4 gigs of RAM. And that actually was, was well, it was an exciting time, uh, especially for those that launched subprocesses uh, as part of their ordinary operating uh, environment. They would then invoke the auto memory killer, which would then kill the parent, which then would bring down the service and so on and so forth. So it's important to make sure your Canary fleet notices when things go wrong. Um, uh, queryable status and, of course, being able to condition your, your build and release process. So um, that's essentially all I'm saying. Uh, it, as I said, this is a very sh short talk. Make sure that your monitoring system, you monitor your key performance indicators on your Canary fleet before your release process and you condition your automated releases on things more than just does the build work, but does the build behave in a way that comports with all of those other uh, parameters that we expect to behave when it rolls out to the, the full production fleet. Is it? Yeah. What are you building and what are you deploying? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I, work on in, I work on the corp infrastructure team, and so essentially the software that I build and release is not end user software. It is stuff that uh, operates in the background. It's infrastructure. Um, the, the system that actually I'm deploying is the monitoring system itself um, because I'm on the monitoring team. And so we have uh, several thousand servers that just do monitoring and the daemons that run on them that basically serve monitoring activities. And so this is a release process that's designed for server-side software, um, not end-user software. Sorry, I guess that's kind of important. <laughs> yeah, um, our servers run on a, every, every 12 hours on a staggered schedule. Every machine automatically upgrades itself to what the latest version in every repository is. And so by tracking different repositories, they then sit on different sides of the fleet. So uh, you have the, um, you're basically the red box there is just whatever's in master goes out to the unstable repo and then it's promoted up to testing. So it's just a continuous deployment from master? Um, master being? Top of trunk, so. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the, the trunk, the, the main branch, the trunk branch basically is continuously available and unstable and if the unstable version doesn't physically break the machine, if, if the unstable version can be installed at all, then we periodically promote that to the testing repo where it then lives for a period of days to bake in. So we basically have an opportunity to so notice when things go wrong. Right. So there's only one path. There's no exclusion on some sort of release branch or anything else. It's just that no. one path going through. We, we, basically, we basically release right from the... So what's right your remediation drop. when things get to the red box or the yellow box and they don't work? Well, um, things that get in the red box that don't work, we don't promote into the yellow box. Um, things that get to the yellow box that are broken, which happens occasionally, um, we basically... Um, first thing we do is we exclude the yellow boxes from the production workload uh, to basically get them out of the, the, the serving pipeline. Essentially, at that point, a pager goes off if something's not functioning correctly. Um, so we ex first thing we do is we exclude the yellow box. Then, uh, at that point, we, um, because the yellow box has been excluded, we don't automatically promote from the yellow box to the, to the green box. Um, and then we apply a fix in the primary, it, it, on the trunk, um, that trunk then gets promoted to unstable, and if that's valid, we manually push from unstable to the testing repo, which will then get picked up uh, over the course of the next 12 hours to the yellow boxes. We then unshed load back into the yellow boxes to make sure that that's valid. So it's probably the similar thing you do if you're in the green box and you have to do a hot fix? Yeah, we basically, while we have fully automated releasing um, for all the boxes, there is a manual process to basically force a build from the red box into any of the other boxes. And so if something goes wrong in uh, the other ones, we essentially, we have to first apply the fix to the trunk, then force a build, then force a promotion. Hi, so follow up. 
I, I guess I'm trying to figure out, you, you're talking about testing repos, uh, uh, unstable testing and, and stable repo. You're doing the fixes on the trunk. Are, you know, uh, uh, do those fixes go back to the unstable repos trunk? Or um, talk a little more about yeah, kind of this. Certainly. Uh -huh. What I'm talking about here are not separate branches in the, re in the revision control system. We have one branch, one mainline branch in the revision control system. Mm -hmm. That mainline branch is released into unstable on a continuous basis. Every commit to the mainline branch turns into a new version in the unstable repo that anything tracking will automatically upgrade to the next time an upgrade is requested. Um, we then pick complete builds from our unstable repo and move them into the testing repo. These are installation repositories, not branches in our revision control system. Um, and so by using, this is a, a uh, Debian style uh, installer where essentially you can point it at different uh, repositories. So when you say repo, repo, repo on this slide, does that refer to revision control system? No. 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 Okay. That's these are, what. Yeah. Okay. No. These are installate. These are in, uh, collections of installable uh, entities. And so, if you say I'm installing package foo, you'll get a different foo depending upon which of these you're tracking. Okay. And we have hundreds of versions of foo each day in the unstable testing changes. One testing and and, and uh, stable change very infrequently. I'm sorry? Channels, tracks, yeah, yeah. There's, there's lots of different ways of describing it. Essentially, we, we are able to symbolically say, I want package foo to be installed. And depending upon which of those databases you're pointing at, administrative databases, you'll get package foo version 10, version 1,000, version a million. Um, uh, and the rate at which they change. Uh, uh, obviously will be different on uh, the different repos. And so our machines, every 12 hours, run an update cycle um, staggered throughout the day. Um, now, you have options on how you go about promoting. We chose to use, while we do fully automated releasing to the unstable repo um, and continuous fully automated releasing to the unstable repo, we do not continuously release to the testing and to the stable repo. We actually, on Tuesdays, is the day we picked arbitrarily, on Tuesday, the testing repo gets promoted to stable, and after that happens, we promote the last unstable into testing. So basically, there's a, a week from Tuesday to Tuesday where we bake in the version on the canary, and we know that if all of a sudden things begin to go weird on Tuesday, that it's probably something related to the release. Hey, sorry, quick question, uh, kind of piggybacking on top of uh, Ch Chuck's question earlier. Um, when you're talking about changes, how many commits are you talking about coming in here on a, a given day, on average? Are you talking like tens or hundreds? or thousands? Hundreds. Hundreds? Yeah. So if you ever, uh, you've got all these changes going along on one line, on your trunk line or whatever, and you roll it out, it's unstable, fine, you roll it out to Canary, you're like, oh, whoa, we've discovered some OMG problem. But it took you like a day to figure that out, right? So now you've got hundreds of changes that have happened since you started that. But you're still pulling from that tip, are you? Yeah, how we do never you, How do you back. deal with the? We, we never undo a bunch of changes in a row. It's, it's a little bit weird. Um, some of our build tools make it very easy to always roll forward, never roll back. Mm -hmm. And so essentially, we can roll back individual changes, <clears throat> but we don't ever try and undo an entire day's worth of changes. Mm -hmm. So once we find the thing that changed the, 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 the actual error-inducing change, right. we basically create a new change that reverses that change. And right. so that's our rollback change. And right. we then do a new build now from the trunk that undoes that. Right, no, I, I get that. So what you're doing is you're landing, like, here's, here's bad change happened back here. You don't know until you get in, into your canary system. Now you're 100 changes later, and you're like, oh, let's land a fix that fixes that problem from yeah. 100 fixes changes ago. But could any of the inter... Have you ever hit a case where the 100 changes in between now cause a new different problem, and you find yourself in another kind of, oh, here's another bumpy day because we found a different problem in Canary? And yes, you know, like, and that stagger sucks. Along? <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. Um, in a nutshell, yes, and that sucks. The good news is, though, that many of those hundreds right, of yeah. changes don't directly impact our product mm -hmm. because we we're a company with one large code base. Um, some teams use change branches where basically they then create a separate branch just for their releases and they cherry pick in the things that they want for that and then they're able to make branch specific fixes. We as a team discovered that we don't have enough personnel to monitor a change branch. So the odds of us running into that problem and the effort that it would take to prevent that problem from happening. Um, there, screen locked. Um, uh, over time are greater than accepting that risk as something that we're just gonna run into when it happens. And it has happened where basically things are broken for an extended period of time. And there's, we have the ability to use a tool which basically will reversion a release as a later release number. Uh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> Where uh, this, is, this, is, this is entirely internal software, so it's not really a, a horrible thing, but it's really a bad thing to do, and you feel bad when you do it, where essentially you go and you pull down from the archives a lower numbered version. You then renumber the release as a higher number release because you know this one works, you then push it out, and then everything upgrades to the new version, which is the old version. Yeah, we, I'm not saying we've done that, <laughs> but I'm saying people who look a lot like us and work in the same cubicles and show up at the same time may have done that at some point in the past. <laughs> yeah, being able to reversion a package, uh, uh, it, this, was, this was a dirty trick that was discovered because part of our release process, the build tool stamps the releases with a particular version number that wasn't convenient for uh, us logically. And so we wrote a tool that just rewrites the version number um, to a sequential uh, number that can be tracked back to our uh, uh, source control system to the uh, revision, to the point in the, in the uh, mainline trunk that it was built from. Um, they used a timestamp version, which we didn't want. We wanted the, the trunk version. And so someone discovered that, oh, hey, this tool can be used to make anything, any version. Yeah, so anyway, on, the, on that note, I think, uh, yes. So as a release engineer in Caskey's organization. <laughs> I'm, a bad, I'm not a release engineer, I'm an SRE. My responsibility I, I, I will say, you know, our best practices are, you know, the, I love the questions because I knew they were coming. I'm like, oh, people are going to ask questions. You release from head, really? You release from head? Uh, we do have, we have, in infrastructure, we have hundreds of projects. I mean, I, oh, I support ease. Yeah, I easily support, my team supports uh, a couple of thousand projects within TI, a technical infrastructure. Um, and so teams are often left to decide their best way. We, we help them decide the best way to do their releases. And so we have teams like Caskey's who just, you know, uh, uh, push on green, basically. People. No, no, bad no, no, it, it, well. <laughs> So I'm just saying our best practices and what we do, we have tools that do allow you to do a more traditional branching and cherry picking and so forth. But it doesn't work for everybody. And so, um, uh, so that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I just couldn't resist. No, 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 no. It's fine. What was interesting about his talk, I thought, was the monitoring. I was, I was fascinated about the monitoring piece of it and how the packages get there and where you get them from is... Um, independent of the monitoring. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, is we discovered because we run so fast and loose with the, with the releasing, we need to know as soon as possible if a release is bad. But nine time, 99 times out of 100, a release is just fine. And so it basically began to wear on the fatigue of the individual engineer to manually validate the release every single week. So we basically automated that process so that we would know when we are in that one in 100 times. So basically, a couple times a year, something would go completely wonky. And we needed to know as soon as possible. But we didn't have the engineering resources to dedicate to manually validating every build every single time. 